Dr. Ted Venema Talks Audiology, the educational whiteboard series brought to you by Next Gen Hearing. Hi, I'm Ted Venema, here to talk to you about otosclerosis. Otosclerosis, a not so common middle ear pathology, not nearly as common as, for example, otitis media. Nonetheless, its causes are quite unique, and so are its audiometric findings. There's a few very unique audiometric findings associated with it, and we'll go through these today. It has a rather odd name, really. Sclerosis really means a hardening. And, but otosclerosis itself is actually a soft growth of porous bone around the foot plate of the stapes. Really, it might want to be, you might want to call it otoporosis, a soft growth, like a neoplasm growing around the foot plate of the stapes. At any rate, it is hereditary. If mom or dad has it, chances are one of the kids is going to have it. Otosclerosis tends to be more common in Caucasians than in African Americans or African Canadians and those of Asian origin. It is, um, we, to understand otosclerosis, let's look at the middle ear system itself. The middle ear system is, conducts, it conducts sound. And as a system, it has mechanical properties. It's a system, the ossicular chain and the eardrum attached to this. The ossicular chain is stiffness dominated. Think of the middle ear. These are the smallest bones of the body. They, as such, they don't have much mass. The resistance offered by this system is actually caused by the tiny ligaments holding the ossicular chain in place. So really, the only, the third main thing about this system is its stiffness. All mechanical systems offer impedance, which is comprised of mass, stiffness, and resistance. Well, the middle ear is a stiffness-dominated system. And otosclerosis serves to actually increase the stiffness of this already stiff system. As a result, you will get conductive hearing loss with otosclerosis, a prevention of sound being conducted through the middle ear system to the inner ear or cochlea. But otosclerosis, because of its unique pathology, it's not an infection, because of its unique increase of stiffness that it gives to the middle ear, has a, a two rather unique audiometric findings. And this helps clinicians delineate it or differentially diagnose it from other middle ear pathologies. Figure one shows you the tympanogram of a normal hearing person compared to the tympanogram of somebody with otosclerosis. You, when you're looking at a tympanogram, the, the horizontal axis represents air pressure, positive, neutral, or zero, and negative. The vertical axis represents the stiffness of the middle ear, or its inverse, compliance. The more compliant something is, the less stiff it is. Well, with tympanometry, and we went over tympanometry in a previous whiteboard uh, session, tympanometry involves a probe inserted into the ear canal, creating like an airtight seal. Now, the whole premise behind tympanometry is air pressure has got to be even steven on both sides of the eardrum in order for the middle ear system to work most efficiently. So what they do with tympanometry is present a tone out of the probe and measure the amount of sound bouncing back or being reflected off of the eardrum as the air pressure is changed from positive to room air pressure to negative. And we try to find out when is the middle ear the most compliant. When is least amount of that sound reflected back off the drum, ergo when is most of the sound passing through the drum, at what air pressure. A normal tympanogram shows that most sound is passing through the drum, the middle ear is most compliant, at room air pressure. And that means that the air pressure on the other side of the drum, the medial side of the drum, is also air pressure. Remember the main assumption. Air pressure, even Steven on both sides, makes the middle ear most compliant. At any rate, 
otosclerosis is not an infection. Now compare this to otitis media. You see with otitis media, beginning with negative middle ear pressure, oxygen being sucked out of the closed middle ear space by the porous lining of the middle ear cavity, creating negative air pressure, well, you're going to need negative air pressure in the ear canal to match the negative air pressure of the middle ear space, and that will show the tympanogram of someone with otitis media. And then, of course, as we said last time, too, as the infection turns to fluid being present behind the drum, well, then the tympanogram has no peak. Now, contrast those tympanograms of, ot of otitis media to the tympanogram associated with otosclerosis as is shown in figure one. As we said, otosclerosis is not an infection. There's no change in air pressure behind the drum. The air pressure is the same as it is outside. So the tympanogram will have its peak with otosclerosis over zero, over neutral, regular room air pressure as is normal. However, otosclerosis is caused by, or causes, re results in a further stiffening of the middle ear. And as such, the tympanogram with otosclerosis is simply squatter or shorter. Now, the normal tympanogram is called a Jerger type A tympanogram. The tympanogram associated with otosclerosis, however, is called an AS for stiff. So the tympanogram is situated over normal air pressure, however, its height is smaller, it's more squat. That's one giveaway of, oti of, of otosclerosis, as opposed to otitis media. Figure two shows you the unique audiogram associated with otosclerosis. Now, audiograms show the results of right and left ears by air conduction testing, headphones, and by bone conduction testing, placing a, an oscillator on the mastoid behind the ear. Tones are delivered either through the headphones and later on then through the bone oscillator. With otosclerosis, a unique finding presents itself. First of all, what's not unique is that the hearing loss is conductive. You'll note on that figure, or on the figure, that the X's and O's, the right and the left ears, those require, there's more decibels required by air conduction for the client to just barely hear the tones. So there's a moderate degree, you'll note, a flat degree, equal hearing loss sensitivity across the frequencies for the right ear, the O's, and the left ear, the X's. What's unique about otosclerosis, however, is Carhartt's notch. And that's this little downward slope of bone conduction, sloping down from normal at 250 hertz down to about 20 decibels at 2,000 hertz, and then improving again at 4,000 hertz. You see, with conductive hearing loss, when you present a sound through the mastoid bone, through an oscillator placed on the mastoid bone, you are bypassing the troubles of the outer and the troubles of the middle ear, and you're delivering sound straight to the cochlea. So conductive hearing loss, one of the earmarks, so to speak, is hearing loss through the headphones and normal hearing by bone conduction. Such would be the case with otitis media. With otosclerosis, Carhartt's notch appears in the bone conduction hearing sensitivity. Now, many people might think, oh, this might show a little bit of cochlear inner ear hair cell damage at 2000 hertz because when bone conduction hearing sensitivity declines, well, well that's an indication of sensory neural hearing loss. But Carhartt's notch is really not an indicator of slight sensory neural hearing loss. Very interestingly, it's called Carhartt because of Raymond Carhartt, who was like the father of audiology. It's one of the classics in audiologic literature, Carhartt's notch. It's just an artifact of the way in which we test for bone conduction. With bone conduction, to have normal hearing by bone conduction, there's three main contributions to normal hearing sensitivity when we present sound through a, an oscillator placed on the mastoid bone. The first one is called distortional bone conduction. Distortional bone conduction means you're just activating a cochlear 
traveling wave by vibrating the mastoid bone when you're presenting a tone this way. You're causing the hair cells to be excited and the patient or the client responds. That's the main contribution to normal hearing by bone conduction, but there's two others, inertial and osseotympanic. Now, think of inertial first of all. The middle ear ossicles, as we said earlier, are not attached really to the skull directly, they are attached by ligaments. And so when you're vibrating the skull with a mastoid oscillator, the ossicular chain not being formally totally fused to the skull, it's going to lag a little bit behind in, this, in it with inertia. And this inertial lag is going to cause the, the middle ear ossicles to push slightly in and out of the oval window the stapes, pushing the stapes in and out of the oval window of the cochlea, thus improving bone conduction a little bit. A third contribution to normal hearing by bones, bone conduction is osseotympanic. Again, with, because you're vibrating the, the mastoid with an oscillator, you're creating a tiny column of air movement in the outer ear canal. This occurs as a result of vibrating the skull ever so slightly. And that little moving column of air pushes against the tympanic membrane, against the ossicular chain, thus in and out of the oval window with the foot plate of the stapes, and that also slightly increases bone conduction sensitivity. Well, with otosclerosis, the pathology, that porous bone surrounding the foot plate of the stapes, you now have the middle ear ossicles fused to the skull. And as a result, you've lost inertial contribution and you've lost osseotympanic. You've lost those two loving feelings. And you've only got distortional contribution to bone conduction sensitivity remaining. Now this is the lion's share, it's the big one, but why is Carhartt's notch always at 2000 Hertz? Because the resonance of the middle ear ossicles is around 2000 Hertz. And with the bones fused to the skull and the lack of these two contributions, putting it all together, you end up with a slight loss of bone conduction hearing sensitivity at 2000 Hertz, the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Otosclerosis has knocked out two of these contributions, leaving a slight bone conduction hearing loss at 2000 Hertz, but remember, it's an artifact of the way we test bone conduction hearing. It's not an indication of slight hair cell damage inside the cochlea. Ergo, Carhartt's notch. Carhartt's notch may be an artifact of bone conduction, but because of the unique pathology presented by otosclerosis, only otosclerosis, only otosclerosis could teach us that. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>